Hello and welcome once again to Eye of the Needle, a podcast from Columbia Threadneedle Investments that aims to demystify the world of investing and put a spotlight on the people looking after your money. I'm Jim Griffin, Investment Content Manager, and joining me as co-host is Karen Walker, Investment Campaigns Manager. Hello, Karen. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Jim. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. You enjoying the snow? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not venturing out into it. I'm not brave enough. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't blame you. Uh, and who is joining us on the pod this time around, Karen? Well, our guest today, Jim, is Pauline Grange, who is portfolio manager on the Global Equities Desk, with a particular focus on global sustainable equities. We'll be talking to her about her asset class, the rise of sustainable outcomes investing, and the massive impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the world around us. Welcome to the podcast, Pauline. Hi. Uh, This episode will also feature our ongoing ABC of Investing series, This Month in History, and three things to ask your IFA this month. But before we get to all that, this episode we're heading straight into the 60 second challenge in which Pauline has one minute to explain to listeners all about her asset class focus. So Pauline, um, you work on the Global Equities Desk, but what exactly is that? Uh, What makes it different from other desks and how does your focus on global sustainable equities fit in? Hopefully you can enlighten us on all that within 60 seconds. Are you ready for the challenge? Yep, let's go. (laughs) Good luck. Your time starts now. Okay, so our Global Equities Desk invests in equities only, so not in other asset classes such as fixed income. We have a focus on markets around the world, um, including both developed and emerging markets. How it's different to other desks, we we just have, you know, we're spoiled for choice. We can look at best ideas and invest in best ideas from all around the world. We're not technically restricted by where a company is domiciled, which increasingly, you know, shouldn't matter as businesses have become more global in their operations and sales. And how does, uh, you know, global sustainable equities fit in? Well, As I'm sure you're all aware, sustainability is an increasing issue globally, um, whether it be environmental or social sustainability. And so businesses who um, are positioned uh, better from a sustainable perspective, you know, increasingly that's become a a driver of growth for them, improving competitiveness for them, um, as well as higher returns. And so... Oh, there goes the klaxon. I think you got a lot in there, though. That was good. That was, was a multifaceted yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, I think we got a very good flavour of it then. Uh, and we'll pick it up later, of course, uh, later on in the podcast. Yes, but before we get into um, the asset class and your working life in more depth, um, we're going to continue our exploration of the world of finance with our ABC of Investing. That's right, listeners, our attempt to demystify the jargon heavy world of investment and personal finance goes on. And this episode, we tackle V, W and X, what I like to call the business end of the alphabet. It's also where Scrabble novices go to die. Um, So let's see how we get on. V is for variable rate mortgage. This is a mortgage rate that, as the name suggests, can and does move up and down depending on the mortgage lender's variable base rate of interest. This itself will rise and fall based on the performance of the UK economy. So if the Bank of England base rate changes, you can expect your variable rate mortgage to follow suit. Make sure you would be able to afford your new monthly repayments if the interest rate rose. W is for wrapper which can be placed around an investment vehicle to make it tax efficient. For example, an ISA or a pension. This tax efficient wrapper means individuals that invest in that product can legally, of course, avoid paying some or all of the tax on that particular pot of money invested. X is for X-ray. Yes, we've cheated a little bit here, but you should always perform an x-ray on your personal finances and investments to check you're getting value for money. Do you have the right mortgage or savings account, for example, or are your investments, including your pension, performing adequately with your desired degree of risk? A regular x-ray or spring clean of your finances can help answer these important questions. (laughs) 
Right, Karen, let's get back to Pauline. I think it's time to find out more about how she approaches the world of investing. So, Pauline, as we heard in the 60-second challenge, the Global Equities Universe covers a lot of bases. But can you tell us more about the Global Sustainable Outcomes Universe compared to this? Sure. So, for our Global Equities Universe as a whole, um, you know, we're we're looking across all sectors, um, but we do prioritise companies which we view have strong and sustainable competitive advantages, which in turn should feed into above-market long-term returns and growth. For global sustainable outcomes, um, however, we have that same focus on strong competitive positions, but in, in but we are also sort of tailoring that in to look for corporates who through the products they produce or the services they offer, help to address and solve for some of the world's biggest environmental and social challenges, uh, whether that be helping to reduce carbon emissions and enable the climate, trans- you know, the transition to cleaner um, energy, um, or whether it be to help improve the health and well-being of um, the populations around the world and address social inequality. For the global sustainable outcomes, we we also have a number of exclusions, which are pretty standard for responsible investment funds. Um, for example, we have no, we don't want to invest in companies who sell alcohol, tobacco, because that contravenes with what we're trying to achieve in good health and well-being. Um, but really, for the strategy, I like to focus more on positive inclusion. You know, the businesses we in, are investing in we believe will not only have outsized positive impact on the planet, but will also in turn help to deliver solid you know, benchmark beating financial returns for our investors. Yeah, now you, you mentioned a number of kind of sustainable themes there. Can you tell us a bit more about them in detail and why you think um, this kind of approach matters and why is, why now is the right time for it? Sure. So um, if we sort of take a step back a bit, um, the United Nations in 2015 established a number of what they called sustainable development goals, which are 17 goals which they set up for um, to, you know, to frame a, a to direct um, investment, both from a government and a private um, capital perspective into businesses which will contribute towards positive social and environmental change. So they set up a number of targets, all being set for the end of 2030. For the Global Sustainable Outcomes Strategy, we use these development goals, of which there are 17, to frame our sustainable themes, which cover environmental as well as social outcomes. Um, you know, we have a decade now to achieve this. So we are sitting now, well, less than a decade, we're at 2021, um, and these targets have been set for 2030. Unfortunately, the pandemic has really highlighted the urgency of addressing these environmental and social targets. Um, you know, it set us back a bit in terms of social inequality. And really, you know, our way out of this is to try and address that, as well as it's highlighted the fragility of the earth um, and of us. And so, and through this year, you've also seen a number of um, more devastating natural disasters, such as the wildfires in Australia and California. California. And so the urgency of addressing climate change has also been has also raised over the last year. Um, and so if anything, you know, this the strategy becomes more relevant as we head into the next decade. Now, as you mentioned there, Pauline, we are, of course, living through a global pandemic that has changed the way we do things. Um, and last year, as COVID-19 really took hold in Europe and our lives were altered in ways we probably wouldn't have imagined. Um, You wrote a fascinating viewpoint on 10 factors that could change economies and markets forever in the wake of the pandemic. Um, And we thought it would be a good idea to revisit a few of those factors now. Yep, that sounds great. Okay, so, I mean, the first one you talked about um, back then was peak globalisation and how in terms of consumption and supply chains, um, countries will start to think more about where stuff you know, items, goods, consumables actually comes from. Is this still the case? And has anything changed in the past 12 months? Yeah, things have changed. Um, you know, we at the beginning of last year, as I raised the point, you know, we when China went into lockdown, we saw um, quite a lot of disruption in supply, whether that be electronics, 
uh, automobiles or healthcare consumables such as PPE, which we needed in our hospitals. So really there's this, been this growing awareness at a corporate level that they can no longer rely on just one region or one country such as China. So you have seen um, companies start to diversify their supply chain and also move some supply more locally. Um, nowhere is this more, um, it has this become more evident than in the technology sector. Um, so last year there was an escalation of the US-China trade war. Um, and really you saw um, firstly the US put a number of, um, I suppose, sort of trade embargoes on Chinese tech companies such as Huawei, where they no longer allowed um, these companies to have access to American um, IP or patents. Um, and China in turn has become more insular in their tech investment. Um, and they realize they can no longer rely on American technology companies. And so in fact, last year for the first time, China invested more than America, than the United States in R&D. And so you are starting to see this sort of regionalization of tech. And you're also starting to see that in um, climate technology. Um, where people are starting to refer to climate wars, where China has um, invested very heavily in electric vehicles, battery technology um, and solar technology and starting to dominate there. Whereas Europe has become the leader in renewable energy. So you're starting to see regionalization of that as well. And I think as the fiscal stimulus packages um, come into place, both in Europe, UK, and in the US, here again, governments are going to prioritize local jobs and local companies. So I don't think, you know, globalization isn't going to disappear, but it's definitely changing. It's really interesting. Um, another factor was the advance of the medical community. Um, so science development of vaccines are gener generally considered the way out of the pa pandemic. I guess you haven't changed your stance on this. No, if anything, it blew me away how fast yeah. they did it. Um, you know, there's really the the pace and the success of several vaccines. Um, you know, that surprised, you know, it's exceeded all my expectations. And it's really testimony to the huge advances we've seen in medical technology over the last decade. Um, you know, if you put that, if you put it into context, before this pandemic, it took more than 10 years on average to develop a vaccine. We've done this, you know, we've got several successful vaccines in less than a year. And Moderna, who, you know, which is one of the biotech companies who have developed a vaccine, they, will, they were able to develop a vaccine ready for human testing in just 42 days from receiving the genetic blueprint of the virus. And they did that using one of, you know, a new and um, innovative vaccine technology called mRNA. And I mean, this, this is astounding, you know, usually takes years with traditional technologies. Um, so we're, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic if we were able to make, you know, to develop all these vaccines as well as therapeutic treatments for COVID in less than one year, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic on a way out of this um, over the next year. That's very heartening to hear. Um, <laughs> Uh, changing tack slightly, um, the growth of online consumption and the shift to digital payments was, an, was another factor you raised. Yeah. This one's here to stay, isn't it, I think? Yep, and, uh, yeah, indeed it is. I mean, again, the the, the pace of the, the, the transition, uh, whether that be from offline to online consumption or cash to digital payments, it really exceeded everyone's expectations. So consumers were forced online as you know lockdowns ensued around the world, but also corporates had to accelerate their investments into their digital platforms. Um, and uh, you know some stats really have been started to come out of um, the United States, where last year they saw an incredible 44% year-on-year growth in online sales. That's 3x the 15% jump you saw in 2019. And several of the, you know, the digital corporates that I've spoken to speak about an acceleration in this transition, how COVID has accelerated this transition by several years. Mm -hmm. um, and that online penetration in the US is now above 21% versus 15.8% you know, in 2019, that's an increase of 5.5 percentage points year on year, the highest since records have begun. 
So as we look forward, you know, that that level of growth is definitely, you know, you can't repeat that um, in 2021. So the question becomes, will that absolute dollar amount of online consumption drop? And I don't think it is. I think, you know, firstly, corporates continue to invest in their digital platforms and continue to transition their businesses towards an online world whilst consumers are increasingly comfortable consuming online. Um, and certain parts of the demographic who had never consumed online before have now embraced the, the online platforms. Um, I was just reading you know, a, a comments from Ocado, which is a UK grocery delivery service this morning. And they noted that the global grocery landscape has been changed for good. Um, and I see that with my in-laws. They they never consumed online before the pandemic. And now they happily make recipes from HelloFresh and buy all their <laughs> groceries online. And they love the convenience of it. So there has been a cultural shift. You saw this in China as well, where you know they, they had saw this huge boom in e-commerce. They came out of lockdown. And in fact, e-commerce sales remained robust and companies continued to invest in online platforms such as Tmall, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think it is here to stay. Will the growth be as high? Possibly not. You've got some pretty tough comparisons, but I don't think it's going to drop from here. And how about the rise of working from home and flexible working? Do you think, you know, many office roles have become home-based without skipping a beat? Is this the new normal? Um, I don't think in its current form. So I would, you know... I, I think, you know, I would hope that we will return to the office um, at some point. It's very important. We're social creatures. Um, if I look at our desk, you know, we're creative. We want to share ideas. And it is quite hard to do that naturally online. Mm. But I think the flexibility of being able to work from home more, that will stay. Um, and that's a positive. Um you know, they working from home has been proven to improve increase productivity, but also it enables more diversity in the workplace. I'm a working parent. You know, it, it was tricky before if my nanny was sick, um, if I had to go to children's plays, if their children were, you know, if my children were sick. Now I'm, you know, I'm able to work from home and deal with some of those. So. Mm. From a gender diversity perspective, um, I think it's great. Um, and so, but will it be in the current form of 100% work from home? I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, last year, you also spoke of the possibility of, uh, quote unquote, the rise of the green agenda and perhaps a more moral capitalism. Um, how do you see this progressing and are the two intertwined? Okay, if I, if I take the first part of the, the question, because obviously they're, they're two quite big topics. Um, so if you look at the rise of the green agenda, and um, I'm very happy to say, yes, it, it has risen um, on the agenda of governments around the world. Um, so last year, we saw the globalization of net zero policies. Um, and this is a big positive. So what do I mean by net zero policy? It's where governments um, will set a target for a certain year to have net zero carbon emissions. And this brings them in line with the Paris Climate Agreement, where the goal is for the world to have net zero emissions by 2050. So firstly, you saw the EU who put their Green Deal at the heart of their COVID fiscal recovery program. And they've, over the year, also accelerated their decarbonisation target to reduce carbon emissions by 55% by 2030, off 1990 levels. But the big surprise last year was China, um, who um, is a big, you know, is the biggest uh, contributor to climate emissions. And they set a target to be net zero by 2060. And this now, by the end of the year, has brought nearly half of the world adopting climate neutrality goals. We now have Biden in the US and he's made positive indications towards um, America setting a net zero target. And were the United States to do so, we would have approximately 60 percent of global emissions covered by net zero agreements this year. That's a big positive for climate change. So if we shift then to um, 
moral capitalism. So what do we need by moral capitalism or responsible capitalism, as it's also known? So capitalism before was very much focused on one stakeholder, um, so shareholders, the owners of the business. Um, and that's great. But increasingly, there's pressure on companies, both from a government and a um, you know consumer level or social or population level to look more at their um, at all stakeholders. So whether that be how they treat their employees or how do they um, you know support employees, how do they support their suppliers, how do they create value for consumers, and also to look at the true cost of their business, not just in um, dollar amounts, but also on the impact they have to the environment. Um, and so what you saw during the pandemic um, is really, it's really heightened the importance of this, whether this be the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which was a movement against systematic racism around the world. And that's forced a lot of companies to address um, their employee base and to start to address um, you know, the, the bet improved racial diversity within their employees. Um, also on supply chains, you know, COVID led to um, some of the, you know, retailers, as an example, um, being named and shamed when they didn't um, honor their contracts in Bangladesh, which led to, um, you know, heightened uh, poverty levels for the, uh, for the country. Um, and that too, you know, has um, risen. So how you treat your suppliers is now having real world implications. Um, and so are the two intertwined, um, you know, this, this sort of reshaping of how we view capitalism and the green agenda? Yes, I think it is. You know, corporates have a moral responsibility, both at a social and an environmental level. And as you see the green agenda rise, they're also going to face increased regulation. They're going to face... Um, you know, movement in terms of they will have access to cheaper financing if they if their products help to resolve some of the environmental problems around the world, whether that be through social or um, green bonds. You see a valuation uplift um, if you shift towards more environmental or socially aware products. And so there are financial implications. And I think this will only grow um, over time. Is there anything else not in your original 10 you think might be here to stay? Um, yes. So you know, I think COVID has highlighted the importance of uh, healthy healthcare systems um, around the world and also as well as the health of general health of your population. So um, you know, it's, it's really, I think here at, you know, in the UK, people have seen the importance of the NHS and having a strong NHS. And so you, you know, and sustained investment into that um, health and health spend per capita. But also we need a cultural and lifestyle change. So that's also had an influence. So obesity um, is, you know, it ha comes with a number of problems such as diabetes, et cetera, but it's also put people at greater risk um, to COVID. And so you saw um, here in the UK, Boris Johnson, he U-turned on his obesity stance previously after contracting COVID-19 himself, and he's really shifted to a focus on a healthier lifestyle. So they're now proposing new measures here in the UK to, to introduce a ban on TV and online ads for food high in fat, sugar and salt before 9 p.m. And they're also looking to end deals like buy one, get one free on unhealthy food. And there's a number of other initiatives in the in the pipeline. So I think, you know, this this increasing government focus, not just on healthcare systems, but the health of their populations, that will change after COVID. Um, another one I can think of is, you know, the rise of sustainable agriculture. So you know, it has been highlighted the risk we face as we increasingly encroach on wildlife and on nature that, um, you know, this transmission of viruses from um, wildlife to humans, that could increase, that risk can increase. And so we need to um, look at the, the, the farming that we do and the deforestation that comes from farming and try and address that. Um, and so this will force countries to start embracing more sustainable agriculture practices. Mm. And at the consumer level, it may accelerate the adoption of more plant-based diets globally as we become aware 
of the environmental impact of um, eating meat and proteins and other proteins. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think some things won't change. Um, so, you know, although travel, leisure travel and live entertainment have been part of this, you know, some of the sectors most severely hit uh, by COVID, I think people are craving to have fun and have, you know, experiences again. Um, and that, that, that will return. The demand hasn't gone away. And some people are comparing the potential post-COVID period to the roaring 20s after World War One, where everyone was just desperate to get out there and have fun again. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, some things I think will change and hopefully some will return back to the way they were. Yeah, yeah amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for your insights there, Pauline. Um, We'll be coming back to you a bit later to learn more about the face behind the fund and ask your rapid fire film and music questions. Uh, first, however, it's time to take a step into the financial past to see what was happening in February throughout history. 16th of February 1659 saw a cheque used for the first time in Britain as a Mr Nicholas Vanneker settles a debt with a Mr Delbo for the sum of £400 or roughly 50000 in today's money. The first pre-printed cheque form, apart from the Bank of England's, was issued by Veer, Glynn and Halifax in the 1750s and in 1811 the Commercial Bank of Scotland issued the first cheques pre-printed with the customer's name. On 3rd of February 1730, the London Daily Advertiser newspaper publishes the first stock exchange quotations. They've been carried by newspapers in some form ever since. On 15th of February 1971, it was all change for Britain's loose change. This was decimal day and out went pennies, bobs and half crowns and in came the system we still use today. Although we were late adopters of decimalisation, playing catch up with much of the rest of the world. Uh, so none of us are old enough to remember any of that happening, I don't think. Um, <laughs> but given how I struggle to convert pounds and pence into euros, Hungarian forints or what have you, I don't think I'd have coped very well with that change to decimalisation. Right then, Jim, let's crack on with part two of our fund manager grilling as we find out a bit more about the face behind the fund. So, Pauline, let's look back at the start of your career. What made you want to become a fund manager? Well, I actually planned to become an accountant and <laughs> I um, started off doing holiday work uh, for Investec Asset Management in South Africa um, as I was going to start doing my master's in accounting um, following that holiday work. And I, um, having doing work there, I realized it's a fantastic environment. Um, it's dynamic, it's interesting, um, it's multifaceted, and um, it was much more fun than, um, in my view, <laughs> personal view than being an accountant <laughs> and um, yeah I was I was hooked and um, I haven't really looked back. <laughs> no regrets there then. Um, so what does a typical day at work look like for you and how has that changed in the pandemic? Well my typical day now starts with feeding children and <laughs> dealing with homework schedules but um, <laughs> yeah. th that's what's changed in the pandemic but more juggling. Um, uh, you know, I, a typical day for me is, um, you know, opening up, reading the news, looking at the markets from overnight. Um, it's, um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of sort of, um, we're like sponges. We have to take in a lot of information. Um, and that's, that's what I love as well in, in that it's, um, it really diversifies your knowledge globally and across, um, you know, multiple sectors. We're kind of knowledgeable in a lot of things, um, which is good at dinner parties. Um, <laughs> and um, so that, that, that sort of started. And then the day may vary. Um, you know, I can meet with company management this at the moment online. Um, previously, I would have met them in person. I can attend a conference. Uh, where you can have um, people, you know, leaders in different topics speaking, as well as um, corporates, you know, corporate management from around the world. Those are always great to attend. Um, it can be you know, meeting with clients and marketing to clients and presenting and, you know, trying to and, and just trying to tell the story of what we're doing here. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, for global sustainable outcomes, these are, you know, these are businesses that um, we really believe are going to make some great positive impact for the world. Um, 
And so I suppose that's, you know, what I love about the day is no two days are ever the same. Um, it's also meeting with our team, uh, sharing ideas, meeting the, with central research. We have this amazing resource pool at Columbia Thread Needles. So with, um, you know, specialists and in, in all their in all their subjects and all their sectors um, and it's sharing ideas with them. Um, it's gaining their insights. So. Yeah, it's 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 never boring, put it that way. And how often are you thinking about the end investor or clients when you work? Well, you, you never you never don't. Um, you know, that's that's the, that at the end of the day, they're your boss, really. Um, and we're we're also invested in our funds. So I have my pension, my ICES, my children's ICES. You know, they're all in our in our products. Um, and so um, that you know that's everything um it's everything you do is um you know who are the owners of this and i think increasingly that's why sustainability is important because some of the new asset owners the younger generations increasingly care about you know the impact and you know that the the corporations are having um socially and environmentally of course great um we'll wrap up this segment with a few rapid fire questions for you Okay, we'll start with, what's your favourite book? can never choose a favourite book, but I can tell you I'm currently reading Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evarista. I'm sure I've mispronounced that, but it's a really good book. Um, and it follows the lives of 12 different women. Um, and it just, you know, it highlights the differences and the, ch- and the challenges we face as across generations and classes and race, but also some of, you know, the, 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 the common challenges and struggles that we as women face and we need to change going forward. And um, it's very good. I'm hooked into it. So I, I recommend it as a read. Brilliant. Yeah, my wife is reading that as well, actually. <laughs> it's a popular one. Um, what about a favourite film or TV show? Uh, so, again, it's very hard to choose that, I'm afraid. But um, film wise, I just, you know, there's so much doom and gloom in the world. So currently we're going through a lot of 90s and 80s films as a family so back to the future is quite popular um my kids for some reason love uncle buck yes i get it (laughs) and they're into fresh prince of belay we're going through the entire series of that um so yeah we're, we're kind of going down a nostalgia trip in our house at the moment um no doom and gloom (laughs) <laughs> no, I guess the, pod, the all the platforms allow you to do that these days, don't they? So. Exactly. What about bands, songs or albums? Um, so yeah, very, quite varied taste. Um, when I'm, I need to clear my head from the pressures of childcare and working from home and that, I, I like to put on a bit of electronic house uh, whilst I go for my walks. Um, I like camel fat. I'm not sure everyone knows them, but um, they're pretty good. Uh, um, it's pretty good electronic house music. I like discovering new artists at the moment. I really like Michael. I'm going to mispronounce this as well. Kiwanuka. Um, I think, yeah, that's great for um, sitting and relaxing with my dinner. Mm. Um, his voice is just so soulful and the music really resonates with you. Um, but also love educating my children with some of the, you know, my favorite uh, older artists, uh, such as David Bowie, Queen, Elton John, Bruce Springsteen. It's just great letting them discover new music. Um, I think it's very important, which is new for them, um, but old for me. And they, um, yeah, they absolutely, they absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Yep, quite varied. But, yeah, um, wide ranging there. <laughs> um, and uh, if, if you're into sports, a favourite sport or sports team? Yeah, sorry, not into sports. <laughs> I, people always presume I'm South African, so I've got to love rugby, but well, <laughs> I'm a bit you. more into arts and uh, um, sort of the cultural side of life. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fair, enough. fair enough. What about um, desert island food? Desert island food. Oh, again, it's really hard to choose. I love everything. Uh, <laughs> it would probably be, if I had to pin it down, um, an amazing uh, meal from Provence. Some lovely fish with a great Provence, uh, Provencal rosé sitting in the sun. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Especially oh. as it snows outside. <laughs> We're all yearning for that. that yeah, yeah. No. Uh, and a, a hard one, admittedly. Who is your hero? Or heroine? Or heroine? Um, <laughs> of course. Uh, 
I don't, you know, I think if I, being South African, I'm going to have to say Nelson Mandela. Um, you know, our, our country was not great growing up. Um, you know, I grew up where I was in a white only school. I went to white only cinemas. Um, you know, it was, it was a, an offense to, to bring um, sort of my black friends to the beach with me. And Mandela fought for that change, that everyone has an equal vote and an equal right. Um, and, you know, he, he, he went to prison uh, for a very long time. And he came out without bitterness. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to forgive, for all of us to forgive and forget. And, um, yeah, it still makes me a little bit teary, but um, I just wish we had more leaders like him around the world who can um, make change for the positive and also learn to forgive those who transgress. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, finally, back to your career, um, mm -hmm. what would you consider your greatest success professionally and is there anything you would do differently if you could go back in time? Um, you know, I, I, I try and I think what I'm what I'm hoping to do um, is that my greatest success is still to come and that's to um, educate more and more portfolio managers out there about responsible investing mm. to try and shift the narrative and capitalism towards one where we do look at running businesses and investing in a more holistic manner, looking at both the social and environmental impact, not just the, the sort of dollar amount. Um, so yeah, I'd say that that's still it's still something that I'm working on. Um, and I think, you know, it's been a big learning curve. So I'm very proud of where I've come from. Um, but there's still still a lot of work to do, to go. Good stuff. OK, well, um, before we finish, uh, we're going to quickly look at three things you can ask your IFA this month. Now, ISA season isn't quite what it used to be, but it's still worthwhile taking advantage of your yearly tax free amount as we near the end of the tax year. So although the returns may not be much over 1%, they will at least be tax-free if you wrap them up in an ISA. We're approaching the end of the financial year, so it's as good a time as ever for a bit of a spring clean. Uh, now, earlier on, we mentioned looking at your mortgage, savings accounts and investments, but you could also examine all your insurance policies, be it life, motor, house, critical illness or income protection, to see if they're still suitable. Better terms might be available elsewhere or where the term is due to end, you can see whether protection is still actually required. Ask your IFA about your options. And talking of a spring clean, why not have a think about your financial goals for the rest of the year and the future? Might your lifestyle change? Do you have property plans? Have you thought enough about retiring and estate planning? Talk to your IFA about the future and making sure you can match your financial needs at every stage of your life. Well, that's about it for this episode. Um, all that's left is to thank our guest, Pauline Grange, for joining us. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and also thanks to my co-host for this episode, Karen Walker. Thanks for having me too. Problem. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back next time when we'll have another fund manager to take on our 60 second challenge and talk us through their specialist field. If you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, uh, let us know at podcast at columbiathreadneedle.com. But until next time, thanks again for listening and goodbye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty, guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N6AG. 
authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies.